have your Bibles with you, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Psalms, chapter 100. Tomorrow night we have our prayer walk in the gym. Please come avail yourself to that at 7 o'clock and pray that God would just continue to move and minister in hearts and lives. Psalms 100. Now I'm going to give you, somebody asked me if I was ready to preach. I hope you brought lunch, supper, and a meal for next week. My, my notebook says 43 pages, which I know it's not going to be that long. But I, I want to I give you just a tidbit here. I'll, yeah, you'll get yeah, I know you would. <laughs> I want to give you a tidbit. And I want you to think about something. A few months ago, on a Wednesday night, Sylvia preached a message about coming in the presence of the Lord. So many times we come in, we stand up, we sing, and we ask God to have His way. We never honor who He is or what He's done or understand who we're standing in front of. It's all about being in His presence. And I don't know about you, but if I were in the presence of the Lord this very second, I don't think I would be talking about the University of Alabama and then saying how great thou art the next moment. And so I just want you to think about that a moment. But stand with us. We're going to read this, I'm going to pray, and we're going to go to the Lord and just sing together. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know you not the Lord, He is God. He hath made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Why? For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. God's been too good to you and I. God's been too good to us. So would you just lift your voice for a moment in praise? before we sing. Father, you're a good God. You're a merciful God. Lord, so many times we haphazardly walk into your presence and God require of you to do something and we've not done anything. So Lord, I acknowledge you this morning. I acknowledge your goodness, your mercy, your strength. I acknowledge, God, that you put breath in our life. Lord, if it were not for you, many of us would not be standing and sitting in your presence. Even as I spoke to that individual today, it's all about you, God. So, Lord, we're here to worship you in spirit and in truth. May our hearts and our minds be totally upon you this morning. Thy name we pray. Amen. Remain standing. Let's sing to the Lord today.
matter what you're going through personally or what we're going through as a nation, it's not caught God off guard. Matter of fact, it's hard for us to see this, but it's part of His plan. Oh, you're going to have to swallow deep on that one, aren't you? Everything is part of God's plan. What we're going through as a world is part of God's plan. And I've, I've said this for months. I'll say it again to you today. It's been a great spiritual wake-up call that we've ignored. We've ignored it. As a nation, we've ignored what God is trying to say to us. But I think as individuals, some people are getting it that God is greater than anything. And He will put us on our knees. He'll stop us dead in our tracks to let Him know He's God. Pride has to go. Rebellion has to go. And I, I'm, you know, I told you, I'm full of stuff. So hold on. This one's free. But He's in control. So I want you to just close your eyes. And I want you to quit worrying about November the 4th, November the 3rd. I want you to quit worrying about the Democrats and Republicans. Quit worrying about what's going on financially, what's happening around the world, what's happening with our missionaries even now. But I want you just to trust God with all your heart for just a moment and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Father, I trust you. You are sovereign. You are merciful. You are just. You have not changed. But how we see you has changed drastically. God, may we see you sitting on that throne and your train filling the temple and you're in complete control. We have taken our eyes off of you. God, we've done it on a personal level. We've done it corporately. You are in complete control. So Lord, whatever they're dealing with this morning, whatever we're facing, you are in control this morning. I trust you, God. You have ordered our steps. You have ordained our life. I trust you. Lord, fulfillment of your word is right in front of us. And if we cannot trust you in this hour, we do not have that hope, that blessed hope that we need. So God, restore it this morning. Restore that hope and that peace, in thy name we pray, amen and amen. Turn around and smile at somebody. Wave at them. You may be seated. The offering plate is in the back. We are also giving online. Our missionaries need your support. A lot of our missions and missionaries, if you'll notice, we've been trying to share it with you. A lot of them, their ministries have started back, and then in some areas they've had to close them back down. Please, please hold them up in prayer. Continue to support them financially. Pray for Doug and Ramona. Their heart is in Nepal. They're in Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka has shut back down. But you know what? God's got them there for a reason. And I just pray that God will use that. Pray for different, all the missionaries that God has just blessed them in a very special way. I have your Bibles with you this morning. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 16. I want to thank everybody that is filled in. It was 12 weeks today, the last time I preached. Did not realize it till the other day. Was really looking. And I just cannot thank you enough as a congregation and as individuals. You have been through us through, with so many valleys. Thank you. And, and I want to commend the church publicly. When the pastor, for any reason, disappears for any season, normally things just kind of fall down. But ministry 
not only maintained, but it continued and increased. And that is a great, great thing for a church to do. May God richly bless you, bless all of you that stepped in and did so many different things and ministries. May God richly bless you. Uh, some of them that have been preaching are going to continue to preach on Sunday nights, and I'm going to sit on the front row and enjoy them for a few weeks and kind of get my strength back. I'll do Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, but that does not give you an excuse to not be here on Sunday nights. I'm taking names and numbers. I'm back. Okay? And if you haven't heard from me yet, you will this week. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He has just acknowledged Peter confesses that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, upon this testimony, Peter, I'm going to build my church. Then you're going to find on the other side, sandwiched on the other side of this conversation, is going to be the Mount of Transfiguration, which is going to be just a tremendous moment with Jesus and just a few handful of the disciples. But in between that text, is where we're looking at this morning. Jesus starts to give them an insight of what he's about to do. Matter of fact, when he talks about he is going to go to he is going to be crucified, Peter actually rebukes him. And Jesus has to bring correction. So we pick it up in Matthew chapter 16 verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You ever read that? Think about that a moment. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. That, that will preach by itself. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what a man is profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I can just see Jesus sharing this conversation. For the Son of Man shall come into the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. And then he makes a very strong statement. Verily I say unto you that there be some standing here which shall not, ta shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. If you'll look at verse 24 of the text, Jesus says to the disciples that are standing around, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, when we say cross, we think of pretty jewelry. And when we say cross, let me give you just a little thought here. We know of the crucifixion of Christ. And we have mental pictures that we have to get out of the way to see this text. Christ would not carry the whole cross. He would just carry the upper beam. And it would not just be Christ and those other two male factors that would be hung on Golgotha. Around this time in the life of the ministry of Jesus, the disciples have been following Jesus now for about two and a half years. Fix and go into that third year, that final few months of the ministry. And for your mental picture, historians would tell us that there have been almost over 30,000 crucifixions to this point. So when Jesus makes this statement that you'll take up your cross and follow me, he places a death sentence upon them. They have a visual understanding that Golgotha, outside the city, there have been literally thousands of deaths. 
And we realize that as we, we think of it from that perspective, it changes the whole concept. Because in our finite way of looking at it, we see it as Jesus being one of the first or one of the few and the two male factors. No, this was a common occurrence. So the moment that Jesus makes this statement, then Jesus said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He literally says to them, you're going to take a walk of death with me. Now we very quickly talk about The cross is dying to self, dying to the old nature. And we sometimes even use the cross in a very insignificant way and say, well, I have to carry my cross. You know how it is with my wife or with my children or with my job, and I have to carry my cross. That's not the cross he's talking about. Your wife does not bring a death sentence. Your children do not bring a death sentence. Your job does not bring a death sentence. When you look at this text and we look at it from where he's talking about, he literally says to them, you're now going to walk the walk of death. You're going to die to everything and you're going to follow me. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now they were reminded of what they have already done to follow Jesus. And let me just kind of give you a simple thought here. Peter's standing here and going, hey, wait a minute. Two and a half years ago, we left the fishing industry. We left our families. Tax collector, I left my job. I left these things. And and that, that was my denial of the things of the world. And Jesus says, no, you've just now begun. See, when we talk about self-denial, we talk about dying to self. We talk about trivial things that are here. What if this morning God had asked you, and we have it in our church as a very good illustration, what if the Lord asked you this morning to die to self, sell everything you have, and move halfway around the world? What if God asked you this morning to walk away from everything that you have, everything that you know, to follow Him? What if the Lord said to you, give everything away, follow me? God, I'm just not ready to do that. I'm not ready to deny you to that, deny myself to that point. I've got to have a little comfort. That's not what Jesus was saying. To deny ourselves literally means to become a disciple of Christ. Self-denial means putting God and His kingdom first. We think coming to church on Sunday is self-denial. We think a little sacrifice here, a little there. No. And then the second thing that He said, and, and I'm going somewhere, hold on. This is real simple. You know this. And we can talk about this in deeper ways. The second thing that He says is take up your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Lord, this is the the side of it that I don't know about, but it's not, it's willing to pay whatever it costs to follow Jesus. To take up the cross literally means that I die to self, I die to everything inside of me, I die to everything that I have, and God, it's yours. Matter of fact, it's like I said a moment ago. It's a walk of, of, of death. It is, it is symbolized in saying, God, I take this cross and I literally die to everything that is around me. God has a way of getting our attention. It's a willingness to endi- endi- endure shame, embarrassment, rejection, persecution, and even martyrdom if possible. Taking up the cross is some, not some mystical thing that we do or, and we put it upon our shirt or we put it upon our, our necklace or we put it upon our bumper of our car. Because you see today in some third world countries for people just to take up their cross and follow Jesus means that they'll be killed instantly. Instantly if they're found worshiping Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. 
I got to ask you a very simple question here. If standing outside the door this morning was our local law enforcement officials that were given direct orders that the moment you stepped out that door to take your life for serving Jesus, would you be sitting here now? If this morning God were to ask you to do things that you've never done before or go places you've never gone before, would you be willing to do it? Christianity has become so casual. Living for Jesus, we've made it easy. And God looks at this and He looks at them and He says, Deny yourself, take up the cross, willing to start a death walk with me, because the cross represents suffering. It represents everything that we have turned into what it's not. Matter of fact, if we were to talk about the cross and the suffering of Christ, we could literally take months and talk about what He went through on our behalf. But that cross represents so much there. Now turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 16, 21. And I want you to look at something here. From that time forth, Jesus began to show His disciples how that He must go unto Jerusalem. Suffer many things of the elders, of the chief priests, of the scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. We have beautiful portraits of Jesus hanging on Calvary with a thorn around His face, few trickles of blood down His cheeks, few scars here and there. We have a beautiful picture of Him having just a few little piercings in his hands and his feet. But according to God's word, he was beat beyond recognition. According to God's word and according to everything that we can find about it, not only was he beat beyond recognition, his beard was plucked, there had been swelling that had been taking place, he had now been gone almost 24 hours without any sleep, his head had been covered, he had been beat with a rod, he had, been, he had been whipped. Matter of fact, I'll be just as cruel and gruesome as I could be. There's not a portrait that we could paint that could show the reality of what Christ went through. But we have it all cleaned up. and We have it all personified. And we have it all set in our mind that this is what suffering looks like. This is what denying the cross looks like. This is what taking up the cross and following Jesus looks like. And I am so glad that when we look at God's Word, that's not what it is. We look at it from a totally different perspective. Matter of fact, we find the place that He had already been beaten so beyond recognition that His back was so whipped. And then the cruelty of it, of taking the cross beam, putting it upon His shoulders and telling him to walk that death walk to Golgotha. You get the picture. Take up your cross and follow me. Can I just say to you a few months later that the moment that Jesus told this to the disciples, they literally stood there and watched this. Matter of fact, they scattered when all of this happened. But I want you to, I want you to go with me here now and I want you to think about some things with me this morning. Jesus, and this is where I really had to really sit down and just get along with God. There comes times that we just cannot do it by ourselves. Let's be very transparent. There are times, brothers and sisters, your cross gets too hard to carry. There are times that denying self has got you as low and as far as you can go and you're pressed down and you're beyond anything else left. And how many of you realize that everything was ordained in God's Word for us to see, a, see what's happening? 
How many of you realize that every one of us have been tricked into this very simple thought that we have to just bear our cross regardless? Now this is a reality. This is a, this is a real conversation. I don't care if you call it preaching, teaching, whatever. It's a reality of it. There comes a time when we're carrying our cross it may be physical, it may be emotional, it may be a family crisis, and we, we have done all that we can do, and we are carrying the family load, and, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, it gets you down so hard that you cannot get back up. It has got you down, and I'm not trying to be sacrilegious of what happened to Jesus. I'm trying to give you an analogy here for you to understand something with me this morning. There comes a time where you cannot do it by yourself. But there is a teaching out there that is so erroneous and wrong and people are so loving that will say it, well, it's just your cross to bear. Bear it. Get over it. Buck up and move on. Well, guess what? There's no buck up left. There's no strength left. There's nothing left. I'm gone. I'm on my face. I'm exhausted. I cannot do anything else. And that's when God comes. That's when God shows up. When self is crucified, when self cannot move it, when self says, I cannot, can I make it simple? When I am weak, He is strong. And there comes a time that God will put you in that place where you have no strength left, you have no stamina left, you have gone for days, you've gone for weeks, you've gone for months, you cannot, you cannot put another foot in front of the other. You cannot put another thought in front of the other. You cannot move. You are, you are just so crushed down. And I'm going to say this with love and I'm going to show this to you. Then the Holy Spirit bends down next to us and goes, Now, can I help you? Now, can I help you carry this? Because... My burden is easy. Oh, God. But I've been taught that I've got to do it. God, I've been taught that it's mine to bear. Then tell me why in orchestration of God and in God's perfect plan and Jesus being told that He must needs go to Jerusalem and everything work out in its perfect plan and God have a man coming from Cyrene by the name of Simon that has just come to Jerusalem that just comes to make a sacrifice in Jerusalem that just happens to be standing there that just happens to be coming to give a sacrifice of a lamb is now going to carry the cross beam of the lamb of God just why because it's not chance it's not happen chance God always always has somebody or someone, the Holy Spirit of Jesus, to come and step in right in time. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 32. And I want you to understand something with me. God always has that right person at that right moment. I don't know about you, but I've seen total strangers be used of God to help me carry my load. I've seen men and women that would call me in the midnight hour or somebody say, Pastor, I've been praying for you and holding you up. And I know the very next thing that you say is, Oh, this is Jesus. This is the Son of God. He could carry His cross. No, He couldn't. We find consolation here, and I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but Jesus did not carry His cross to Golgotha. Sometimes we have to stop and realize we've seen it one way for so long. We have it set in our mind. Matthew 27, 32 and 33. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled 
to bear his cross. Now I'll just go ahead and tell you what happened. A Roman soldier is walking along. Jesus has slowed everything down. They're trying to get past. They're, they're, they're just trying to move things. Jesus has fallen down under the weight of the cross beam. And the Bible says they compelled him. Can I get, go ahead and tell you what really happened? A Roman soldier took his spear, laid it upon Simon's shoulder, and said, either you carry it or you die. That's the reality of that. That's the compelling part of it. And you look at that and go, well, it was just a man there that was forced to do that. If we think of it like that, we miss the picture. How many of you realize that God is sovereignly in complete control? God had him there. God had the Roman soldier pick him. God let everything happen. And I'll just go ahead and fast forward and look at it later. Not because of what happened in his life. His two sons and his family served God. But the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, 32, 33. As they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear the cross. When they come into a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of skull. So what does it say? It literally says that this man carried that cross. Now I don't want you to analyze and say how far it was. And I don't want you to look at it and go, why? I just want you to know that Jesus had somebody, that God had somebody ordained to be standing there and to carry that cross beam, that beam of death, for Christ. And it doesn't lessen what Jesus did for you and I. I want you to understand something with me this morning. We, are very, we have a very hard time sometimes putting things in order. And, and so many times we create an atmosphere that God says, wait a minute, I didn't ask you to do it like that. I didn't ask you to interpret it like that. See, you and I have a mental picture. Let's just be very transparent. We have a mental picture that when Jesus is given the cross, He's given the whole cross. Why? Because we've seen it in too many dramas. We've seen it in too many plays. And it's just kind of embedded in our heart and our life. We see Him walking the Via Della Rosa. We see all this taking place. And we see Him taking it all the way there. The Bible says Simon carried the beam. Was compelled. Was ordered. Was ordained by a Roman soldier. If that's the case, we have to understand that God is in complete control and God orchestrated every bit of this. Why? Because Simon came to Jerusalem to sacrifice a lamb and wind up carrying the sacrifice for the lamb. The beam for the lamb. How long did he carry it? It doesn't matter. He carried it. It was laid upon his shoulders for him to take care of it. There comes a time that in life, It's too much for you to bear. It's too much for me to bear. But we have a mindset and we're very guilty of this, of saying, well, that's my cross. I've got to bear it. I've got to get where I need to be and I've just got to bear it. What happened, what happened of us understanding that the Holy Spirit wants to come alongside and comfort us? What happened with the very simple fact that when we call upon the name of Jesus, it changes the concept of things? So many times, pride gets in the way. And we find ourselves looking at things and saying, God, I've just got to do this. And, and let, me, let me just stop. Get over here. How many of us are stubborn? How many of us are hard-headed? How many of us are full of pride? How many of us are arrogant? How many of us just believe we can do it without God? Can I go ahead and tell you? Then God's going to put more and more and more and more on you till He gets you down on your face. And then the moment He gets you on your face... He's going to look at you and say, I'll help you if you'll let me. Because you've got to deny what? Self. Self has got to die. 
pride's got to die. It's something about crucifying our flesh, our nature, that we don't want to do. We don't mind it when it comes to salvation. We don't mind it when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. But can I remind you of something this morning? We were at a very low place when we come to Jesus. We had nowhere else to go but Jesus. And when we came to Him, He all at once changed everything and we were able to deal with life. But now that we're living a Christian life, now that we're kind of growing in the Lord, we just don't think we need to go back there. And God says, you've got to stay there. You've got to keep crucifying that nature. You've got to keep crucifying self. I'll be honest with you. This is probably one of the, one of the hardest lessons that I've had to learn is that I cannot do it by myself. I cannot. You want to be humbled? Get somebody to have to help you out of the bed two weeks prior to that. You're walking. You want to be humbled? Let God get a hold of you and say, I've got you where I need you now. And then you start denying self and you start crucifying self and you start crucifying the flesh and you let God have it. Because when, when we let God have it, God starts doing things in our life that we can't even start to comprehend. You have to understand something. Jesus looks at you and I and says, I was tempted just like you were. I went through the same sufferings like you did. I went through the same trials and tribulations you did. I went through the same humiliation you did. I went through the same crisis you did. I went through the same things. I know what it is for the burden to be so heavy. This is the Son of God, Son of Man talking to us. I could not carry my own cross. But God had Simon ordained to be there. And we look at this and we say, well, don't cheapen what Jesus did. We're not. Because when He was here upon earth, He showed us that the cross was meant to bring us down. It was meant to bring us to a place Look with me, if you would, at the John chapter 15, verse 5. John 15, 5. Jesus says it. It's all throughout the Word of God. He says it to us in so many different places. Paul is going to say it to us in so many different places. But I want you to hear what he says. John 15, 5. I am the vine... You are the branches. He that abideth in me and on him the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now we love to stop right there. For without me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Pastor, I don't know why I keep doing these things and nothing's coming from it. Because we're doing it and not denying ourselves and not giving Christ the glory that he deserves. Flesh has not died. Our nature has not died. And because of that, we're just producing fruit that's not doing anything for anybody. I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, and I am him the same, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Can I remind you? It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by His Spirit. Oh, but I've been saved for 30 years. I can do this. Oh, but I, I, I've been teaching Sunday school. I'm in the choir. I, I'm saying, I'm doing. No. It's not by might. And it's not by power. But it's by His Spirit. You know what my prayer has been? Crush me, God. Crush me. Crush me spiritually. Mold me into what you would have me to be. Make me in what you would have me to be. God, take the cross beam 
and drain everything of me out. Crucify the flesh. Crucify the nature. Crucify everything that wants to rise back up. Crucify it. Because when I am weak, then you're strong. We're trying to live a Christian life based on our might, our power, our authority, and our intellect. We will not win. Can I shock you? Satan knows the Bible better than you do, and he's a loser. It's reality. The moment you let him rule and reign, the moment you die to self and say, it's not about me, and it's about Him. It changes everything. The cross, crucifixion was about denying self. And, but you know, it's amazing. We have one stronger than Simon. We have the Holy Spirit that said He would comfort us. He would never leave us. He would never forsake us. But I'm going to go ahead and say this, and I hope you get this illustration. We're walking around with our cross, and we look at the Holy Spirit and go, Oh, leave me alone. I got this. I don't need to pray. I don't need to fast. I don't need you, Holy Spirit. And I'll go ahead and tell you what the Holy Spirit does. He departs. He will leave you if you quench Him. He will move back. And what happens next is it gets heavier, it gets stronger, and it gets harder. And the moment you get down, I just love this. The Holy Spirit comes and whispers in your ear and says, now can I help? Because I've been called to come alongside you. I've been called to empower you, to be here for you. You cannot do it without me. Jesus said it like this, I must go that he would come. The comforter has come. How many of you are sitting here this morning and you feel comfortless about a lot of things that are going on and you feel like they're totally out of control? Can I tell you what's happened? You have pushed the Holy Spirit out and said, I'll carry this cross without you. We can't do that. Life would be so much easier if we'll give it to Him. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. Our spirits are willing to carry our cross, but our flesh has to get weak. We have to crucify the flesh. Flesh has to die. We're, we're over here as a church world singing, I'll do it my way. And Jesus is over here saying, just sing the old rugged cross. Just stand under the shadow of the cross. Crucify flesh, crucify the nature. And we're over there, no, I'll do it my way. As a matter of fact, can I say it and not, be, not take it wrong? We actually look at the Holy Spirit and we sing, I shall not be moved. So He doesn't move us. He lets us carry it. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8-10. through 10. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Won't you look what he says next? For my strength is made perfect in weakness. We don't want to acknowledge that God's strength is made perfect when we are weak. How many of you would agree with me this morning that we have a very strong-willed generation? And, it, and I didn't want to go there, but I'm going to go there. Ever since everything has hit our nation, from COVID to the election, our will has gotten stronger rather than weaker. We've gotten uglier and bolder rather than more submissive and quiet. And I'm going to say this, and I want you to hear me very loud and very clear. The moment we let God have it, it's going to change everything. 
But the moment we decide we don't need God, you better hold on. It's going to get worse than we've ever seen. As a nation, as a family, and as individuals. The moment we decide that it's it, my will is going to override God's will, it gets very dangerous. But Paul, he said to Paul, Paul said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. Oh. In infirmities, in difficulties, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress of life, in chaos, in things that I cannot control, in things that are overwhelming me, in things that are chaotic, in things that are not the way they're supposed to be, in things where I am an A-type personality and everything around me is going crazy when everything is so wrong and everything is so bad. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. Quit trying to control it and let God have it. Quit trying to control and let God have it. God has a way of getting our attention, brothers and sisters. God has dropped us to our knees. He's dropped us to our face. He may have done you already. I know He did me. But when these things happen, when He casts me down to the ground, to that place, that process, that pain, that sorrow, that hurt, when He puts us on our knees and He puts our face in the ground, then He looks at us and says, Now, trust me. Let me raise you up. Let me bring you back. Walk by faith and not by sight. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians Chapter 1. When you're down, when you're at your lowest place, this is where the Holy Spirit comes and whispers in your ear and says, now, this is where I need you to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see calling, see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble are called. Hmm. But God's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Now, I don't know how many times I've read this, but when I put it back into the text that I shared with you this morning, how many of you have forgotten about Simon? Simon of Cyrene carried the cross beam to Golgotha. But see, his glory was not in his flesh. And because of that, we just naturally take him out of the story. Because see, we see Jesus and him crucified. Simon did not stand in line that day and say, I want to carry the cross beam. Simon did not stand there and volunteer. The Roman soldier laid a spear upon his shoulder and compelled him. But the Bible would tell us that his family would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus because of what Simon would do for Christ. Okay, I get this, Pastor, but what are you saying to me? I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, the moment that flesh is glorified, we lose the whole purpose of what God is trying to do. It's not about you. 
It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's not about me not able to carry my cross, but it's about me admitting that I cannot carry my cross without Him. It's not about my prideful attitude of saying, I'm too big for this. And I'm not going back down to the altar because if everybody sees me there, they'll think that I cannot carry this. That's not the point. Because when I am weak, then He is strong. And I'm going to say this and, and truly close first time. The reason that we're so weak spiritually is because we're not letting Him be strong. The reason that 2020 has knocked us on our, just flipped us upside down, the reason that everything that is going on now has just caused us to, to go into a state of chaos, and the reason that we have an attitude of rebellion, and the reason we have an attitude of anger towards the world, towards things that we cannot control, is because Jesus keeps pushing us down trying to get our attention and we just keep pushing back and we look at it and go, it's got to be the devil. We're blaming Satan for things that God's been trying to do for a long time. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to get us to crucify the flesh, deny self, and take up the cross and follow Him. He's trying to get us to admit that we cannot do it without Him. He's trying to get us to admit that pride has crept back in and it's causing us not to have that walk with God that we need. I'll go ahead and tell you one of the hardest things to crucify is that nature that rises back up. Self. I don't know what you're battling with, but I know what I'm battling with. I don't know what things, I, I know, I'll say this, I know a lot of you are just angry because you're just angry. You're frustrated because you're just frustrated. Maybe God is trying to get your attention. He's trying to get you down where he can look at you and say, when you are weak and you'll admit you're weak, then I will be strong and I'll get you through this. Heavenly Father, crucify the flesh this morning. That nature of rebellion, I speak against it in the name of Jesus. The attitude of anger, I speak against it. Lord, I speak against that one that says it's their way and no other way because God, it's your way. We're going so contrary to what you would have us to do, Christ. We have a rebellious attitude, a rebellious nature. And as you did Saul, we're kicking against the pricks and there will be a day that you'll put us flat on our face and you'll speak directly to us. You did that to Saul. He had a road to Damascus experience and it transformed him. God, I cannot do it without you. I cannot carry my cross any farther. I cannot carry my burden another step. I got to have you, God. I got to have the Holy Spirit to come alongside me. got to have the Holy Spirit to come alongside me.
heads bowed and eyes closed. Hallelujah. Jesus. God, there's some in this room that you have been trying so hard to get their attention. And they have kicked so hard against you. You have brought Simons in their life. You have nudged them through a song on the radio. You have brought even sermons, even this day, even this message. You're speaking directly. We've got to deny flesh, self, pride, it's got to die. We cannot win this battle without you, God. Hallelujah. Stand with me, and if that's you this morning, I'm just going to ask that you come and stand across this front, and I want you just to lift a hand to the Lord and say, Lord, I just surrender. I surrender. It's not mine, it's yours. It's yours, God. If that's you this morning, don't let pride keep you from moving forward. Hallelujah, Father. Oh, that we would deny self this morning. God, if we don't deny it now, God, things will get worse. You will get our attention, God. You will get our attention. Oh, God. Oh, Lord, you have a way. You have a way, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. There's others, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Crucify that nature. Not my will. Thy will be done. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me as we close that you would just crucify the nature of rebellion? And I don't mean that disrespectful. It's, a, it's an atmosphere that's across our nation. It's a rebellious spirit. And it gets in our heart and our life. Father, Lord, I speak very specifically against the atmosphere of rebellion. It's an act of witchcraft, sorcery, that has just overwhelmed our nation. It's like a dark cloud that has settled upon us. Father, we pray this morning that that atmosphere of rebellious, that rebellious spirit would be rebuked in the name of Jesus. It would be cleansed from the heart of your people. God, that you would crucify that rebellious attitude that's overwhelmed us. God, we get so upset about so much that it's not spiritual, but our heart is not broken over the spiritual things. And God, that's an atmosphere that we've seen. So Lord, help us. And we'll thank you for it. In thy precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.